Greetings to those of you who have tuned in today. We're really grateful to be able to share this way whenever you're unable to be here in person and join us face to face. This morning is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Uh, it's the halfway point between the beginning of Lent and Easter. And in a similar way to the midway point of Advent, like when we light the pink candle, this Sunday in the lectionary emphasizes joy in the midst of all Lenten practices. It's important not to forget the joy that's at the basis of our relationship with God. And while the readings today focus on joy, they do so for a certain reason. Either a chronic life situation or a personal burden or a ruptured relationship has been lifted. Briefly, Joshua text has to do with the end of the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. It's over. A chronic situation has ended. In Psalm 32, it says, blessed is the person whose sin is forgiven, who's, who, whom the Lord does not hold uh, their trespasses against them. And so the burden of a ruptured relationship with God is lifted. And in Luke 15, we could have chosen to preach on the prodigal son once again, but you know the story. He, he went from a pigsty to full restoration and he wasn't just back home. He was reconciled to his loving father. So all three of these texts have to do with the lifting of something that has been a burden for a long time. Something happened this past week in our life that brought us so much joy. For two years, there had been a rupture relationship in Ellen's extended family. So each summer we visit in Ohio for an annual family reunion. This summer, the tension of conflict was so thick. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Anyway, we said no dinner this year. We don't need that. And we've prayed. We've been praying the last two years for reconciliation, but positions hardened. Well, this past week, Ellen received news that the right people cleared the air. And I saw a group text just a couple days ago that ended with, let the feasting continue. Kind of like the party for the prodigal. We actually wept together for joy because of the answered prayer. Now here's the thing. Human to human relationships and reconciliation brings tremendous joy when it happens. But the lessons today and the one I'm about to read all focus on greater reconciliation that brings greater joy because it involves the mending of a broken relationship with God Almighty. It's divine reconciliation that leads us and enables us to have human reconciliation. So I'd like to look with you at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21, and keep in mind that while it majors on reconciliation with God, there is a sub-theme that's kind of an undercurrent in the text because the, the author is urging reconciliation between the readers and himself. It's an appeal to renew relationships with God and quite so, somewhat subtly with him as well. So let me pray and then we'll read today's text. Heavenly Father, please, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide the reading and the hearing of your word so that it might be transforming for us in all ways that, that you want to work in our lives. And we pray, pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21, it begins this way, and it, it, it starts with a, a therefore, so we'll have to look a little bit before it, but it says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You've just heard, read in those six verses, 
those six profound verses, the ultimate explanation and reality of how life can go from old ways that have burdened us and will never bring joy to a totally new reality of living. But they've been written in a very specific historical context to a very specific group of people by a very specific author. And so here's the sermon. Who were the messages who received the message? What was the message? And who was the messenger? And how does it affect us today? Well, first, the, the messages, the people who received this letter. It was a Christian church in Corinth, Greece, 56 AD, roughly. It was a church that was a very needy church, you might say. It was marked by sexual immorality. There was an addiction to ecstatic experiences, a division between the rich and the poor. There were factions over preferred leaders based on cultural reasoning and criticism of the apostle who was writing this letter to them. Fleming Rutledge wrote this about the Corinthian church. They were heavily into an individualistic, self-involved notion of the Christian life, self-congratulatory, certain of their own spiritual attainments, certain of their own spiritual virtuosity. And she said, whenever that virtuosity or that sense of our own personal experience exists, and there is a de-emphasis on the atonement for sin and self-sacrificing service, there we meet the Corinthians again. So the Corinthians had fallen victim to what people in every time, in every place fall victim to, whether they're believers or not. Whether it's in the Garden of Eden or on the Exodus journey or on a journey to a far country, we demand our own way of trying to seek fulfillment rather than God's way. Our God-given human desires become corrupted because we want to be in control. John Calvin said that our hearts are idle factories. We find all kinds of ways to put God in second place. And all of us have been either caught up or involved with friends or loved ones who've been ensnared by addictions. Addictions really are idols which involve an unhealthy bonding of desire to one of three things usually, people, possessions, or power. And we may not all suffer life debilitating addictions, but we all have attachments to ideas, to relationships, work or moods, or fantasies, or entertainment. And often because we feel numb in our lives, we seek out temporary thrills that later wreck us, but we keep doing them. Well, the people in the Corinthian church had religious addictions, which created a proud superior attitude and a seeking of the gifts of God rather than the giver. And while we might not be exactly the same, excessive efforts to maintain control of everyone and everything or to seek certain social or financial status or to live with a constant fulfillment of our will be done is knocking on the door, the wrong door, if you're looking for real joy. The way out is understood in that we are really longing for what C.S. Lewis points to, to which many of us have heard. More than once we've heard this quote. He says this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it and to suggest the real thing. And so that brings us to the second point of the message. What is the message that Paul brought? He brought the message to the Corinthians of what the real thing is that we unknowingly and sometimes knowingly long for but don't pursue. The real thing can be found in the titles of hymns. Jesus loves me, this I know. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus paid it all. 
The real thing is found in God's grace in Christ. The real thing is an everyday, guilt-free, joy-filled life. Now here's another line from a hymn. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. Here, now, today, an everyday relationship in which I share my concerns with him and he shares his concerns with me. The two prior verses to our text today tell us what motivated Paul. He says, for the love of Christ, his love for us as well as our love for him, compels us, constrains us. It's almost like Paul is saying, I've been set in a narrow passageway and I can't go backwards. I can only go forwards. And what compels me to go forward is the love of Jesus for me and a relationship with him. And that's why he says in verse 16, from now on, because of Jesus, we now live in a very different way. We used to regard everybody from a human point of view, but we don't regard them that way any longer. In other words, what he's saying is, we don't look at people anymore in the same way, by social status or by wealth or influence or power or prestige. That way of looking, people, at, looking, looking at people is over. Now we see what's possible for a person because Jesus and his love have become have been made real. And he says, we even used to regard Christ from a human point of view. We used to think of him as a historical figure, a great teacher, a prophet, a rabbi. We don't even think about him in that way anymore. Now we think about him as the resurrected Lord, as the king of glory raised and reigning, and whose reign is gonna one day fully be in force in this world. At the beginning of this year, I was doing devotions, and I came across Matthew 20. It was the story of the two blind men and it, it's the passage where they call out to Jesus and Jesus asks that question that he often asks, what do you want me to do for you? And the, their answer was what I made my answer for 2022. They said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And so that's what I was praying. I started to pray, Lord, let my eyes be opened to the reality of your kingdom because it's, there's a very thin space between what we experience and, and, and where God rules in the heavens. So that was my prayer. Breakthrough in my life. Show me, some, show me new joy, new love. Obliterate pride and self-orientation and laziness. A good friend of mine, Pastor Ron Skates, used to be the pastor at Central Presbyterian Church in the 90s. And he would joke around when people, he would greet people at the door and they would invariably sometimes people would say, well, it's back out into the real world, Ron. And he would say, what? He says, you've just been in the real world. Now you're going out to a different world. This is as real as it's going to get when you focus on worship of God centered in Christ. So this whole new way of seeing things and of being is what verse 17 declares. Most, many people memorize this verse. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The God who created everything out of nothing. Now he's, he's comparing that to being created in Christ. So our old life, our old self dies and our new self emerges. And there's a word in here that we can't just gloss over. He says, so and if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. And there's the word see. Some translate it behold. It's almost like when we say, look at that. We see something startling in creation, in, in nature, and we say, look at that. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, see, everything has become new. The word Christ or the word him, which refers to Christ in this passage, is mentioned 12 times. This new, completely, re completely new reality is centered in him. And here's why. Here's why it's so. It's in verse 18. God did it. Look at 18. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. All of this new way of living, this escape from addictions, real joy, is from the God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He's made it possible to have a new identity, to have a new purpose, to have new hope. And here's the message, Paul says. 
Anyone who receives Christ, who comes to him, becomes new because he or she has been reconciled to God through what he did on the cross. You know, reconciled is a financial term. We talk about reconciling a checkbook. We talk about reconciling uh, a debt. We've already spoken of reconciled relationships. Um, We're going to be celebrating 49 years of wedded bliss in August, and people sometimes ask us, what's your secret? And we say, a marriage is made up two of, of two good forgivers. Now, that's human to human, again. That's mutual reconciliation where there's been mutual hurt and mutual concession, but not here. God has set it all up so that we can be reconciled to him. God is not hostile to us. It's we who disregard God. It's we who ignore God. It's we who defy God's will. We're the ones that are in the hostile position. His position is love, and he's trying to woo us into receiving his love. So here's a relationship where God has made everything right, where where a debt existed, it doesn't exist any longer. Where, Where sin and its effect existed, there's forgiveness and power to rise above the grip that sin has on us. God did it all. God set it in motion when Jesus died on the cross. God was in Christ settling accounts not counting our, it says, not counting our trespasses against us. He said himself, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus did on the cross is described in the Bible in many, many different ways, but here it has this feeling of settling a debt. My son-in-law told me a story about how he was stopped by a police officer and uh, somehow in his car there was a license plate um, that, whose registration had expired. And, and um, uh, I think it was on the back of his car. And the police officer took the license plate. He shouldn't have, but he did. And so my son-in-law thought, well, I guess he'll just turn it in to the proper, in the proper place. Well, when he went to register for a car a year later, he went to the DMV and the, and the woman said, uh, you owe $3,500 for not turning in a license plate. He didn't even know it. He didn't even understand what had happened. Um, he, was, he was ignorant, but the, but the debt just kept accruing without his knowledge. But he paid, Jeff paid it. But here's the thing, have you ever seen those commercials for gold and you see the national debt clock and it's going on and on, millions and millions of dollars a second we're going in debt? That's kind of the debt that is being spoken of here. A debt that can never be paid. So many parables use money as a way of trying to communicate the grace of God, the indebtedness that we cannot pay. And that's the way it is with sin, whether we know it or not. No amount of religious duty, no amount of good deeds will balance it out. Only what Christ did through and in, only what God did through and in Christ on the cross. And he cannot state it more bluntly than verse 21. For our sake, for you and for me. He did this. He made him who knew no sin, who had no trespasses, who had no spiritual debt, he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. His his death paid the debt that we never could. And so that's what the apostle says in verse 20. He says, this is our message. And I will always be urging everyone who will listen. If I, was, if I had a bus and I put the sign on the side of the bus, or if I was marching down the street and I had placards trying to get people's attentions, one placard would say, be reconciled to God. Another placard would say, become a new you in Christ. Another one would say, God has made it all possible. That's what the love of Jesus compelled Paul to share with others, to urge others to believe. And that leads us to the third point. So we see who the messages were. We see what the message is. Here's the, what the, who the messenger was. He was the apostle Paul, formerly the Pharisee Saul. His old life was one of trying to follow rules and regulations from his youth up. He hated Jesus. He hated Jesus' disciples. He relentlessly hunted down Christians to have them jailed and murdered. But one bright day, on a road to a town called Damascus, 
he encountered the living, resurrected Lord who carried on a conversation with him. And he was struck blind for a time, but then he was led to someone who put, Ananias was his name, and he put his hands on Paul, and he healed him of his blindness, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that leads us to what the book of Acts says in Acts chapter 9. Here's what it says. Here's what happened to his life then. Then he got up, he was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And for several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. What he was before was completely changed because of his understanding of the love of God in Christ. And that's what he reminds the Corinthians of. He keeps saying to them, you can trust what I'm saying. Stop listening to these false apostles with an entertaining message of self-help. I and those who are with me have been given a message of reconciliation. This is the true word. When it says we've been given a message, the word is logos. It's the same word in John chapter 1 when it says the word, the logos, was with God and the logos was God. He says this is the true message from God. That's what he's trying to get the Corinthians to understand. And Paul says that because of this, we're ambassadors. We're not only sharing a message we've been given, but we are sharing it with the full authority of the one who sent us, who commissioned us to bring us, bring it. And here's the implication, that anyone who is in Christ by faith is also something of an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ in their sphere of life and influence. That's one aspect of application for us, but I want to share just a couple more as we close. Here's what else this all has to do with us in a, cult, in a world and in a culture that's hostile to God. If, like in Corinth, someone tries or has tried to twist your thinking away from the core message of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in favor of something else, choose Jesus. If someone tries to lure you into an addictive experience or reality, tries to tell you that, you know, you can experience life fully by taking this drug or doing this thing, choose Jesus. If someone tries to tell you that all roads lead to God and that Jesus is just one among many, gently try to dissuade them of that fact and then choose him. Every religion, of course, deserves great respect. But every religion also gives great respect to Jesus. But not enough. Choose him. He's not, it's not about a religion. It's about having a relationship with the living God through him. There was a man by the name of Sundar Singh who lived at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. And in a book called Questioning God, the author tells us a little bit about Sundar Singh. He was almost like a modern-day Apostle Paul 100 years ago. He was born into a wealthy Sikh family in what is now northern India. His mother raised him to be a sadhu, an aesthetic yogi concerned solely with spiritual life, and he was deeply educated in Hindu thought. He angrily fought the attempts of Westerners to bring Christianity to his region, and he burned any Bibles that came into his hands. Singh's religious pursuits, however, left him empty, and it, by age 16, he was prepared to take his life. But an encounter with Jesus changed him overnight. His family was stunned and pleaded that he return to his ancestral faith, later chasing him out of his home. Persecution included an attempted poisoning, nearly ended his life. But Singh survived and traveled far and wide to tell others of Jesus. In addition to venturing to Nepal and Tibet, he traveled east to Burma, China, and Japan, and later to Australia, Hawaii, North America, and through Western Europe. Though he sought no fame, crowds made up not only of commoners, but curious intellectuals often greeted him. And among these was a professor of comparative religions at the University of Cambridge. And the professor asked him, what have you found in Christianity that you have not found in your old religion? Singh replied, professor, I have found the dear Lord Jesus. Not fully grasping his reply, the professor pressed on, oh yes, I quite understand, but what principle or doctrine? Tell me, what new philosophy have you found in Christianity? Again, Singh simply replied, 
professor, I've found the dear Lord Jesus. I think if you asked him a little bit more, he would say it wasn't he who found Jesus, it was Jesus who found him. And in the words of another, another hymn, it goes like this, he loved me before I knew him. He drew me with the cords of love and thus he bound me to him. And round my heart still closely twine those ties which not can sever. For I am his and he is mine. He is mine forever. With all that's been said, recognize that he's the satisfier of our souls and in this life and forever. And we can find ourselves no closer to him than when we gather around the communion table and we experience his presence and we feed ourselves upon him by faith. And so let's move now to the table. One of the greatest invitations that's ever been given is when Jesus said, come to me, all ye who are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I invite you today, where you are, in your home, to partake of these elements together. But let me have a blessing. Lord, we thank you for these elements given, these normal, everyday elements that through the Holy Spirit and through faith come to be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. So help us, Lord, to feed on you by faith today. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, the Lord took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of the sins of many. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. So now I invite you to take the bread and, and the cup and receive the body of Christ given for you. Thank you, Lord, for this meal shared with your son. It's a tangible way that you remind us that you are with us. You're not far off, you're very near. And as we feed on these elements, we're reminded that you are in us and we are in you. So we ask that you would help us to remember that our sins are forgiven, that we walk with the risen Christ, and that one day we'll sit in the kingdom table with you at the head. We have a great hope, and we ask this in your name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.